All right, just in case we're already going live, I want to make sure to welcome you to a live version of the More to the Story podcast, where I have three guests who are going to talk about a very important topic, something that has been heating up, not just on social media, but, but I think something that we need to discuss. And when I found out about this information that we're going to discuss about music and worship, I realized pretty quickly that this was something significant and I needed to lean into some of my friends. Hence, we are here live on Facebook and this will make its way to a podcast streaming area near you soon into YouTube and the like. But first, this podcast is brought to you by Wesley Biblical Seminary where we are developing trusted leaders for faithful churches. And we've recently just announced that we are approved by the Global Methodist Church to not only just train future ministers there, but also for their course of study. So if somebody is uh, looking to serve in the Global Methodist Church, we have an easy on-ramp for you to get involved with that to get the education you need. Secondly, this is brought to you by Bill Roberts, who is a financial planner. You can find out more about his information at williamhroberts.com. He's been like he was my, one of my first sponsors to this podcast. So thankful for the way he helps people work through their retirement planning and all those type of things. And finally, I hope you could check out my website, andymillerthe3rd.com. That's Andy Miller, I, 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 where I have some free resources available. One, it's called Five Steps to Deeper Teaching and Preaching. And you could probably even use it for, for uh, thinking about music and worship as well. But I'd love for you to check that out. I'd love to send that to you so you can sign up for my email list. But that's not probably why you're here. You're here because I teased this a little bit and maybe you're my friend on Facebook and you're checking this out or finding it later. But there was a very interesting article that came out for, I saw it first in Christianity Today last week. It said, how Beth, it's titled, How Bethel and Hillsong Took Over Our Worship Sets. And it describes how some of the top CCLI songs all come from the same four mega churches. Now, I need to think about this. And so we, the reason I have brought these three guys is they're going to help me think about that. I have John, Dr. Jonathan Powers, who serves as a professor at, I almost said Wesley Biblical Seminary, uh, but at Asbury Theological Seminary and is the general editor of the new hymnal in the Wesleyan tradition, the pan-Wesleyan tradition um, called, what is it called? Our My great Redeemer's Praise. Great. Yeah. <laughs> My Redeemer's Praise. You can find that at seedbed.com. And one of the songs in there, at least one of the songs in there, is by my friend Phil Legger, who's been on my podcast before, as has Jonathan. And you can find Phil, who's at a conference right now, who just had a new song released. You can find out about that at legger.net. Is that good, Phil? Is that a good intro? Perfect, man. Perfect. <laughs> and then maybe one of the first contemporary Christian artists that I ever knew and praise and worship leaders that I knew and I can still sing his songs right now. So delighted that that Randy Bonifield, who is with us, who is at Christ Community Church and E-Free Church in the Kansas City area. And he also teaches at Mid-American College. Guys, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Danny. All right. So Phil, you're the first one I saw. Uh, you you brought this to my attention. Thanks to your very wonderful ministry on social media. So you <laughs> saw this, and, when we, and I call it that. I call it that. Now, when you saw this, it, it what did what did this do to you? I mean, as the, the basic idea here is that so much in the last ten years has happened through a large church ministry that it has dominated the music that's used in local churches. Tell me your first kind of gut reaction to this, Phil. Uh, I mean, yeah, of course, um, we have become accustomed. I think a lot of things, as I was thinking about these, the, this topic, that we've become accustomed to a few things. And uh, I was trying to think in my mind, like, what does this say about us? And like, one of the things it says is that just as a society, we've become accustomed to high production value on recordings. Uh, and so, um, you know, you go back a hundred years ago or, or however long ago, I keep, I, I was like 25 years ago that I was like, no, I'm, I'm really old. I'm getting older. It's, it's longer than that. A hundred years ago, uh, how we found our music, you know, how we chose our songs was a lot different than we choose today. You know, the, the process by which they got, got into the mainstream of our worship was a lot different. And, and so, um, obviously I think, um, you know, with that high standard of, of, production value on the recordings of songs and the way in which the the curators of our of our Sunday mornings you know find the music is, is by that a lot of times and so um 
it, it just by nature, if you have money, you're able to produce a better recording. So if you're a bigger church, you have more money and you're able to pay your musicians. And so it just goes, you know, it, it builds off of money. I think I don't, that, that sounds a little cynical, but um, I, that was my first thought. But then my second thought was, there is no way that, you know, God is so creative. Uh, there's no way that all of the songwriters are, are at these few churches, you know, there, there's so yeah. many spread out, uh, good songs are spread out all over the world. And so it actually was very challenging to me. And I thought, okay, I need to make more of an effort to see what else is out there and, and, and use some of the other songs that these little artists are, uh, are producing. So that yeah. was, that was my first thought. Like it, it was a challenge to you, like to make sure you're doing what you can to get this out there. Now, Jonathan, you just went through a process where you took a couple thousand years and tried to bring it into one <laughs> hymnal, right? So like the idea of curating material is important to you. And so like wh- when you when you first saw this and you interacted with this a little earlier, you had access to the research a little sooner. Tell me, what, how, how did it hit you at first, Jonathan? Well, there's a few things. Um, the... Um... You know, one of the main driving forces behind these songs that are coming out and that are, yeah, I, I think the uh, there are 38 songs that have appeared on the top 25 CCLI over the past five years. Right. It's been where this is coming out of, right? Like this research. And so um, one that shows that we're not singing a whole lot of different songs over the course of five right. years. You know, like only 38 pop up. And 36 of those came from these four churches, right? Like that's that's kind of the thrust of this article and this research that's happened. Um, and another piece of it is the reason that those are so popular and being put out so much is because there's a market driving, there's a music market beneath this. Right. Um, it's not just that, you know, thousands of churches across America happen to discover Hillsong at the same time. It's right. because there's something pushing it. You know, there's a market behind it. There's a um, an industry that's actually pushing it in some ways. Um, and that, I mean, it's not necessarily a bad thing, just saying that's the reality. That's what's happening here. Um, and, and it's really pushing these these four churches in particular. And um, and there are, um, uh, you know, I, I agree with exactly what Phil is saying. Like, there's a lot more songwriters out there, but there's also a draw in these churches to try to, like, kind of get the prominent songwriters, the ones that are in the, with the labels you know, labels are kind of connecting them to these churches and getting them to do co-writes together and getting them in a kind of a um, a collective of some sort um, with that church. Um, so, um, so, so you have a market that's driving it um, in um, in some ways, and so it's it's um, it's kind of its own curation process, right? Um, like um, they're they're putting together people and they're putting together. Um, yeah, songwriters and, um, uh, and, and, and trying to find um, what is going to be marketable, what is going to be sung, what can we find, you know, is, is it, the, I mean, exactly as Phil was saying, the production quality, the sound of it, and all of that. Um, but what you don't see driving it is, is like theology. Um, right. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a narrow, limited theological perspective in it. For instance, saying like so much of the songs out of those 36 there was a lot of focus on the resurrection, which is not bad. Of course, you know, we we're in Easter season right now. Like this is what we are celebrating. That's who we are. We stand on the other side of the resurrection. That's good. And the freedom that comes with it, which is good as well. A lot of those tend to be very personalized, you know, um, there's not a cosmic sense of it necessarily um, maybe, but, um, but it, it tends to be a lot more personalized. Um, and, uh, and there's not a lot of sitting with the cross. There might be a passing reference to the cross, but there's not a lot of sitting with the cross, as you'll see in like older gospel, um, American gospel songs, for instance. Um, there's not a lot of focus on, you know, let's say from a, I, I, coming from a Wesleyan background myself, um, not a lot of focus on sanctification, which is not, you know, I mean, even reform, that's important in reform um, theology as well. But um, not a lot of focus on sanctification. Um not a lot of focus on redemption of creation, um, for instance, um, you know, the uh, creation care, even um, the stewardship there, not a lot of focus on mission or witness or kind of admonition, you know, for others to, uh, um, to join in this, you know, it's, it, it, it's very personalized um, and, and not necessarily 
how it sends us out to uh, to do more um, and to bring. John, let me jump in there because like this critique isn't necessarily something that you're saying. Like, and you can look at past conversations I've had with Jonathan about music and worship. It's you're not criticizing necessarily praise and worship music as a whole. No, this is this is particularly these songs that have risen to the top, these 36 of the 38. Well, that's it. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly it, is to say um, none of these themes, you know, freedom, resurrection, that's not bad. It's just that when there's nothing else, you know. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, that, that, that's the, and so that's going to become the predominant theology that is understood and known in the songs and what's going to then uh, form the piety, um, the, the worship piety and the um, the mindset, you know, um, if we understand music as prayers to God and, and kind of uh, an understanding of, of who God is too, you know, it, it, um, our, our vision's limited. There's no lament, for instance, you know, like nowhere in there is there any sense mm -hmm. of lament um, and sorrow. When, when um, you know, in, in Kentucky, we just had these shootings in Louisville in the past week, we've had two major shootings in Louisville. And, um, you know, when a group is faced like that, like there's a certain hope and beauty in these songs but there's also um you know there's how, how do you help somebody sit in that sorrow and, and grief yeah, yeah um so yeah nothing wrong with that but like with the to to go to the hymnal you know that was saying like we want to curate we want to hit a lot of different theological themes have a breadth um and to say this can walk you through all the emotions uh the right. full scriptural christianity you know um not just one piece of it but the full scriptural christianity is embodied within this the full narrative um and there's some good ones that you know even in the songs that appear on that list that have good narrative quality to them but i might read some of them here in just a second um yeah. randy you had an interesting piece too because you also like took this as a bit of a challenge as a songwriter as somebody who's had i mean beyond just your local church your songs are are, are in hymnals songbooks um, sung all over the world, but you, you took, I think your third point was interesting of what you were, if you remember what that third point was, Randy, what was, what was that, that you were sharing about how you think about other people's music? Well, now you're, now you're getting me, uh, uh, oh, man, so sorry. I, no, 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 it's all right. I, I think my, uh, so I, I wrote, wrote it basically to worship songwriters, to worship leaders, and then to, um, to the listener or to our, our congregations which was basically a, an invitation for people to explore greater amounts of expression. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like what we get here is a very narrow sort of genre of music that's being represented. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, it doesn't really fully capture the, the, the immensity of God's creative spirit. And, um, and that's what I, I kind of, I miss in, in seeing these four or five different churches that you'll hear a very almost homogenous sound, uh, wow. to that. And, and, and that's, that's what my concern is when, the, when music is so much, it's more broad, it, it has so many different ways of being expressed. And, and frankly, you know, kind of to jump off Phil's point, it's the, I, this idea that, uh, I mean, cynically, what I would say is most publishers, uh, want someone in the room. So Phil isn't going to be able to walk into a publisher and say, here's my song. I want you to use it because they don't have any part in that. It's, mm -hmm. it's Phil's song. Phil is the one who self publishes it. He's the one who wrote it. it without somebody from that publishing house in that room, they don't have an ownership stake in it. So they want co-writes with people from their publishing house so they can have a stake. Now, positively, what I would tell you, I was at a Maverick City concert. I took we took students and our worship team together to a Maverick City concert, uh, which is one of the sort of one of those big groups that is affiliated with this whole, right. whole article. Uh, one of the beautiful things about it was there was a common hymnody that was being sung by churches and people of all races. Uh, and a very diverse group. As a matter of fact, at one point they were asking how old people were. There are people there in their 80s as well as in their teens. Um, and and so there's something beautiful about that, that, that we've established a common hymnody. But as a, as a pastor who sees himself as one of, of uh, spiritual formation, that one of my responsibilities in worship is yeah. to be spiritually forming people, it can't be this narrow. It has to be, it has to be like Jonathan is talking about a much broader conversation about the different aspects of, of all of theology, as well as all of life, what it looks like to live as a Christian in this world. 
Yeah, we were missing that. Phil, could you describe like what's going on musically? Like how, what are some words that people could, uh, some language you could give people to help understand like why does, why do these sound, these songs sound similar? Like, what is it about this? Oh man. Uh, it's, it, oh man, that's a, that's a whole discussion that it's on its own, but the music of it and you go, <laughs> I'm sorry. I maybe too no, 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 it's good. Phil, wouldn't you say that it has a lot to do with the production values? Like the way in which we're producing music is kind of like this squash sort of way, you know, when you go into a studio to record something, it's like, oh, this is how so-and-so recorded it. it I, I mean, wouldn't that you yeah. say that's kind of the there, experience? There are, yeah, I definitely think that's one element of it. And as well, alongside of that, the, just the, the musical, uh, you know, there's, uh, you go back, you know, to 10, 20 years ago and like, uh, like there, just as one example, the, the four over the four chord over five, like was in everything. And, and it was just like, you know, that, that was just, it's, you can tell it's in that style of music and, and you listen to like some of the old vineyard stuff is in that style of music. There's something I call, a. uh, uh a, what a beautiful name effect that has been in, in a, I, I sort of see it on the way out now, but it's that four, five, six, one over three, you, there's like a hundred worship songs right now within it. Uh, and it's just like, it. Get, I don't, I don't know how quite to describe it, except for that it creates a certain feeling and songwriter gravitate. Now that can be helpful because just like we had the, a shared, um, you know, uh, lyrical language, a shared musical language helps people to get on the same page. But if you, you sort of get stuck in a rut after a while, and um, there's definitely much more out there than four, five, six, and one over three. Uh, but <laughs> we, do get, we do get caught in that sometimes. Yeah. Well, thanks for the a little bit of music theory there too for us. I, but there is something right. too that, <laughs> that, that a lot of times maybe somebody can't even identify what that is. They don't know that language, but they know there's something about it. I mean, the songs, here's one of the interesting things that I, I had to conflict in my own mind and heart as I work through these songs is I like a lot of these songs. <laughs> that's the that's the challenge. Like I enjoy it. But then when I hear Jonathan, that critique about um, the, the nature of the theology and the limited scope in the, behind that theology. And then I think about the great music, Phil and Randy, that you have produced, that you've written, that's impacted my life. And I think, I don't want my generation to miss these, my, my kids' generation to miss the type of things that can be produced in these other places. So here's just a few of the songs. Forever we sing hallelujah, the goodness of God, great are you, Lord. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. King of my heart, living hope. I mean, all these things are, are fairly familiar. And we think like, if these are good songs, like why not just give good songs to people? I mean, Jonathan, I mean, for instance, in the hymnal that you've helped edit, there are quite a bit of Charles Wesley songs. I mean, what's the problem with it? Is it is, what's different about this than uh, singing a lot of Charles Wesley songs? Yeah, um, yeah that's a good question. Um, and, and I mean, to, to that point, a number of the songs you just named are in the hymnal. Living Hope, right. King of Kings. You know, I mean, we put a lot of these in the hymnal too. So, I mean, you know, it, it, it's showing that there's some, there's some beauty to it. You know, um, Charles Wesley, um, you know, um, part of what he's doing is this pastoral piece. You know, he, he's a pastor. He's, he's with people. Um, he, he's visiting people in prisons. He's to, like, his work is to be more than a professional musician, you know, right. Um, there's a real pastoral and so that's that's coming out in in his writing too um how do i begin to help people understand the beauty of the the gospel this and and uh he has a song called thou hidden source of calm repose which he wrote to methodist pastors as they were facing um just uh animosity as they went out to preach and to minister you know just to let them know look there's a hidden source of calm repose that you can you know, mm -hmm. you know um and there's something beautiful to it, you know, um, uh, th th there's a richness to it. And so, you know, we want to capture those and say like, there's, 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 there's a depth to it. So, you know, here's, here's something, um, yeah. even for, um, for Christian music, you know, it, it didn't, um, it started off pretty simple. I mean, there, there was some complexity. We can look at the Bible and say, you've got like the, the Christ hymn in Philippians two, right. you know, so there's some complexity to that. But then you look at the the hymns coming out of the book of Revelation, they're pretty short and repetitive, you know, <laughs> um, the, the, the only thing that we hear the heavenly 
hosts singing in the book of Isaiah, pretty short and repetitive, you know? <laughs> um, and so there's something to that, you know, say like some of these can be an okay, there's nothing wrong Holly with Holly a chorus. Right. The whole, I just brought that one up the other day. <laughs> Actually, yeah, very there's not a lot to it. But um there's um there's something to say these can be good starting points, um, but maybe not an ending point. You know, it's what we've been talking about. We've got to expand out. Like this can be a fine starting point for us. Let me give an example here, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm at Asbury and we just had a major thing happen here in Wilmer right. months ago, <laughs> you know. Um, as part of that, a lot of the songs we were singing were the songs on this list. Yeah, yeah. And what they allowed for it. So but here's what happened. There were no screens the entire time. There were no screens used the entire time um, that, that we had this outpouring. You know, so you're looking at two weeks of a whole lot of singing with never putting words on a screen. Um, mm -hmm. The other part of it is we, there were never set lists developed. You know, I was helping coordinate musicians and get people um uh kind of cycled in and out you know of the music leadership there on on some of the days and it wasn't like hey put your set list together and go practice it rehearse it get up there and go it was like no you're going to a prayer room and then you're getting up there and you got to figure out to do music you know but the thing is like because of these patterns and because of these simple kind of repetitive you know that there was a homogeneity you know a homogeneity to them easy to flow into one song out of one song into another and to kind of keep that going and to kind of keep that you know kind of allow something to be there um and then everyone's uh, kind of expand out and go into how great thou art all of a sudden yeah. you know? <laughs> and, and um something else but but there were two things happening uh, it was that common hymnody the lyricism yeah a lot of people knew the songs because they were the ones that they knew you know yeah um, and so we didn't need the screens um, the music allowed it to just kind of sit there, just kind of be there. Um, but even people that didn't know them were able to catch on pretty quickly a lot of times to them. Um, but I saw it as a starting point. I thought, this is great, but these can't be the only songs we sing for the rest of our lives. You know, it's beautiful, right. how this, but um, it should be driving us then. And that's what I've seen here at Asbury is students saying, I have all this inside of me. I'm ready to get out. Like, I want to start writing songs. I want to start, you know, expressing what I've been wrestling with myself. And that's beautiful. It's inspiring something and, and saying, I've got all this theology I'm learning in the classroom. I have this experience of this outpouring and I, I want to let it out now and to share it with people, however I can, whatever that means. And so, you know, I think it's beautiful and say, you know, might not be in the market there, but it can be good for the church, can be good for our campus, good for you yeah. as you work and things. So. Randy, Randy, one of the things you, you likely this Sunday, you're putting together a praise team, a team from your church to serve your church. And you're, you know, you mentioned like serving a congregation. I mean, isn't it almost, it's not just easy, but it, it works to use songs that are on the radio and that people know. How do you deal with that tension with there, there's that reality, but yet you yeah. like to use Phil songs and maybe some of your own songs or people, other so songs like maybe the ones Jonathan's are that is mentioning that are coming out of experience and discipleship. Yeah. And, and you're hitting on probably our, our greatest struggle, which is uh, we want, so we believe uh, liturgy, which is the work of the people to be truly participatory. So for it to be truly participatory, we have to have a language that we share. And so um, one of the easy ways to do that is to say, okay, what, what's popular? you know, and, and then right. grab from that. Right. So we, we do a little bit of that, but I think there's also another value and a calling that we have, which is to give people good meat. Um, and so if that means that I'm having to teach something one week so that we can learn this and, and gather it, you know, it, it, the, some of the harder songs to sing, like for instance, Matt Boswell and Matt Papa have written some really great hymnody uh, they've got a song called uh, Christ, Our Hope in Life and Death, right? Uh, but it's not a real easy song to sing. So you've got to take time to kind of teach it and train it and, and then allow that to come out of your congregation. So I think the thing for me is what I've started to lean more toward is how, how am I voicing my congregation? So when I'm writing songs, how am I voicing what their prayers reflect or the theology of my church, mm -hmm. not, not specifically my church. I don't mean like we have a separate theology than everybody else, but what reflects yeah. the values of my church that, that we could sing. And so right. how can I write that for, for us? Um, and then uh, what's the best of the best and how can I bring that all in? We've actually recently been singing a great song that, that Phil wrote um, recently called as I wait, 
which is all based on Psalm Psalm 40. It's just a really great song, by the way, Phil. Uh, you haven't released that yet, yet have you? No, yeah, that's what I thought. Anyway, uh, only, only so, so sign up for Phil's email so, list so you can find out about that. Yeah. So for me, so for me, it's finding the best of the rest and 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 exposing people to to that stuff as well. Uh, so I I'm maybe I'm a little because I'm a full time guy, and right. this is what I've devoted my life to. Maybe I have more time than other people do to like put their sets together because I know that one of the movements right now within churches is hiring part time worship leaders, sure. or for that matter, we have a company here in town that hires them out each week to different churches. Like, oh my, yeah, uh, you don't have a worship That's leader service. this week. Oh, well, we've got a guy who can come in and do that for you. Um, well, so, you know, they, they have to, yeah, make it up as they go along, you know? So, and, and I think that's part of the problem too, is it's, uh, is that it's because it, it can be itinerant and it can also be part-timers that what we have is them pulling from that common language that they believe everybody knows. Mm -hmm. And so I can take the time and I can train my people to sing really good songs and participate in worship that way. But I'm not sure that that's true of every church. Yeah. Yeah. Randy, I think about when you're saying some of this, you think about responding to your local congregation and respond to the, to these needs. I'm just going to call out a period from a long time ago where you <laughs> did this. You, you, forgive the trip down memory lane. Right. I'm not going to talk about when Jonathan wore baggy jeans and his band that I used to listen to in college. So, oh, I just did. No, but I remember particularly like a CBLI, uh, which was a, a Bible camp that I went to where you served as a worship leader. Mm -hmm. And on a Sunday morning, and actually my grandfather was there preaching, I remember like it was a holiness message, a straight up like second work of grace sort of holiness message. But you came and uh, that evening you said, I was wrestling at this all afternoon. And um, you came and you presented a song and, and there's a way and, and we all sang it and became kind of like a uniting song for us in that period for that group of teenagers right but there's a way it's like that song is so special to me right right mm -hmm. now like i want i say that's in in, in now it's in the savage army songbook right and right. it's in it's all over the world and i want to say whoa, whoa, whoa that that's mine you know I, I i was i was there i was a part of this now what that did is it created an environment where you were leading people and i think maybe that's part of what we miss by going to these commercialized sort of moments. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and what I would tell you is that song, I'm, I'm not specifically sure which song it is you're talking about, but- To Be Holy, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, Fan the Flame. I, I think that's it. Okay, so so that song and some of the others that I wrote specifically for that encampment, uh, they used to have time and a place for them, for me. And I have a harder time leading some of them in my current setting because- okay they, they, they served this group of people so beautifully. And, and yeah, so, it, but that's a, that's another conversation, but I really truly do believe in the voicing of your local people. I think there's something really beautiful about it. And I'd love Phil to talk a little bit about the church he's currently at because they have very much, I believe you guys are focusing on that. Is that right, Phil? That a lot of what the way in which you guys are leading one another kind of comes Phil. from that. Yeah. Yeah, we have a really interesting, uh, uh, not a large church, but um, definitely have probably, you know, we, we've got like three or four or five worship leaders, but we usually do, uh, we have a lot of songwriters and we have, um, uh, for this season, for as long as I've been there, which has only been two years, um, we don't have band. We, it's usually a solo person leading worship. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes there will be an ad hoc team, you know, we'll get up and play, but we definitely value, there's a high value on songs that God has given to the writers of our church. So there's also a high value uh, on, and I know this is not possible in every church, but we have a high value placed on lingering and, and giving people time. So we start off with an hour of worship. Uh, we st like just an hour of worship um, and it gives people time. I know we're not talking about that this this podcast, but that's the soapbox that I'm on lately is just giving people time to get into. We're really good, I think, in some of in, in a lot of the um, many of the Methodist con congregate. Maybe it's not just Methodist, but my experience is we're, we're really good at programming things, but we're not really great at allowing people that that time to just sit. And that's a, 
Um, that's a different thing than a lot of churches I've been in. But what it does is it'll, it it allows people to get into it. And I think, I think that is also very conducive to songs that come from your own people because you can do them three, four times in, in that hour. You can, you can teach people and there's not a high value on everything fitting into a, like this, you know, this rigid structure and I'm not anti-production, but I really think the pendulum can, ser- it would serve us well as a church for it to swing the other way a little bit. And I think Asbury's, the thing that happened at Asbury recently is a really good example of the hunger that is there for that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, John, I, I mean, you question. teach help people how to help plan worship. Like, what's some ways that we can balance that out? What Phil and Randy are talking about here. Yeah, there's a few things. And I, I really appreciate that, that word on lingering too. It's funny because we talk about that and people automatically go to like maybe a charismatic or a, you know, a contemporary setting and everything. The first place I ever experienced that was in an Eastern Orthodox church. Huh. Wow. You go and they chant for like an hour before the service ever starts. And you walk in and you just pray and you sit and you, you know, so it's, I just think it's funny because most of the time people think, you know, way over here, but it's like, you know, first time I ever experienced actually was over here. Um, so it's neat. Um, yeah. When planning and thinking of, um, of, of, you know, different, different ways to, um, bring in music, even just as Randy was saying, you know, um, we can go to the familiar ones to help people sing and to, um, uh, to come in, but to say, um, how do we stretch out beyond that? So it's not just plug and play. We're going to play the songs that we like, or, you know, that seem popular or that are interesting to us right now, but to say there's a whole treasury, you know, why are we going to limit ourselves? There's a whole treasury and, um, and, and how do these songs, um, draw us deeper into the whole of what's happening in worship? So I usually say there's four S's that I look at. Um, when like personally, if I'm taking a music in worship, there's four S's I kind of work through. And um, that's scripture, like what is the scripture or the series, you know, like the, the what, what are we in right now? But um, as an Anglican, you know, it's like, I know what we do the lectionary, so I, I could tell you what we're going to be preaching on in August. You know? And so I can go ahead and sit in those. But as a song leader, I need to, I, I sit, I, I read those scriptures, um, you know, before I choose music. And I, I don't always know what the pastor is going to preach on, but I'm sitting in those scriptures myself when I'm choosing music. So scripture is one. Um, and then season, what season of the church are we in? So we're in Easter right now, you know, and I know not everybody follows the liturgical calendar, but to say, how do we begin to think through some of these things and to look at where we are? And so we're in Easter right now. We've just had Easter. And so Christ, our hope and life and death, we sang that this past Sunday, yesterday, you know, it was our, our last song yesterday. Um, so, um, you know, something like that, just to say, all right, what are good songs that really help us focus on the resurrection? Well, and not just these out here, but what are other ones that we can bring in? Kind of look at all these songs that look at Easter and the resurrection. So scripture, season, um, and then um, structure. Where are we in the service? You know, so if it's this lingering, like what songs really help in letting us linger and to sit in this lingering place for a while? Um, we're about to hear a scripture read. What songs might help uh, invite us into hearing the scripture like the gettys you know speak O lord um or um you know word of god speak or um how firm a foundation i mean just you know i'm, I'm just spitballing here but um where are we in the service you know are we in more of a responsive time are we in a um in more of a gathering time are we in the you know are we celebrating eucharist or whatever is, is it sending you know we're about to go forth what's sending us forth well and so um scripture and then um, season of, of the year, and then structure, where we are in the structure, and then um, setting, and this is what um, has, has just been talked about, like, wh- where am I? I mean, this is what Randy was even saying. This song, I, I don't feel like this is the setting for it. You know, this, it was so fitting over here, but not here. Or even, as I said, you know, um, uh, it, it, this isn't necessarily affecting us as deeply as I'm, I have friends in Louisville, um, who've been more affected by the shootings and things, but to say that that's where we are right now, you know, yeah. um, maybe this isn't the time for us to sing these particular songs as maybe an escapism, but it's, it's these songs that we really need to sit with right now. We're, we're in a particular setting or even cultural setting, you know, yeah, sure. um, I tried to do bluegrass in Uganda one time that did not work. 
Um, just yeah. in case you ever. Or you might not want to sing that Jesus loves like a hurricane after somebody's been through a true hurricane. Right. 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 Yeah. So know your setting. Um, so yeah. those three things kind of, and, and I see them working as fingers on a hand. It's not like systematic. I go through them, but they all work together. You know, um, they're all working together um, at all times. And they can start to expand us to say, oh, we're in the season of Advent, or even it's like, we don't know what that means. We're preparing for Christmas. What are some songs that help us prepare well for Christmas, you know, and not just like get us right there, auto, you know, uh, automatically, but yeah, whatever it might be. Um, but how do all these work together right. um, and not just say, well, we're going to just do it by this or just pick the songs that are popular or easy. Yeah. Uh, Randy, like you, you have anything to add to on like kind of like the 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 piece of what we do now, like how we can counter some of these challenges, like in in our own planning and in the way that we lead people. Well, yeah, I mean, and 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 just to go back and say, okay, the, these four churches are doing this, or we're we're specifically singing these these four, and and we could go back and understand why that would be. There's money behind it. There's, I mean, if, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there are some Hillsong folks who ended up buying CCLI's Song Select. Um, so there's some, even some question about like, how are these songs being presented to us when we go in to look for songs in that, that app that we use, all use to register our songs and so on and so forth. And so because of that, um, it, the countering for me is really more along the lines of understanding the, the theology that you want to impart on your people um, and finding good songs that fit them. That is so, so what I say in, in terms of like these specific churches is find the best of the best and just leave the rest. I mean, you, you don't need to, don't need to be just singing their songs. And, and I mean, we could get into talking about about some specific theology that's even being taught at a couple of these churches that we sure, might sure. go, whoa, uh, is this where I want to be pointing my people to go listen mm -hmm. to songs that capture who God is? I'm not sure in some cases that's true. Um, and so I want to be very, very, very careful about understanding both the source and the content, the substance. So I, I don't need to... I. Yeah, I need to be very careful in terms of like, what am I teaching my people through the songs that we're singing, and 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 the and the who behind it. And then, if if that if I'm not going to choose from there, then let me find some some good resources and some good places to find them, people I trust. And I said this in that post. Look for look around you at the resources that we've got vast resources in terms of trust. Like I trust Phil. And so if I hear a new song from Phil, I'm going to trust that, it, you know, from the heart from which it came, but also the theology that's underneath that. But I also know that songs have been vetted for centuries for us. And we've had all the songs, the bad songs have been weeded out for us already from two or 300 years ago. They don't, we don't hear them. And so the real question is find some sources where they've already been vetted. And, yeah. and, and find some people like, I'm sure that this hymnal that Jonathan's there are, there've been a lot of voices in putting that together and they've vetted very heavily the content of that songbook. That's why there's value in our songbooks and hymn books, because somebody has gone to that, all that work. So if you're a sing, if you're a single pastor out on your own, see, seek those kind of places where you can get some other feedback. So it's not just your own echo uh, chamber in terms of like what you're choosing. And it's so much more than fast, so slow, fast, right? Or right. like setting up songs like let's let, let's really bring it down in the mood why. Right. No, I'm there. I'm with Jonathan. I build my service in, in the fourfold worship, you know, uh that Robert Weber taught, which is gathering word table or response and sending. And so I'm building my service in that sort of rhythm. And so I'm, well, what are songs that really help gather people? Uh, what are songs that help prepare them to hear from the word of God? You know, I'm, I'm doing a lot of that kind of work in the leadership that I'm doing. Well, and I, again, commend to you, everybody, um, not just the folks on this pod, but those who are listening to this, go back and check the podcast out that I did with Jonathan. I think I even did two about our Redeemer's praise and 
this this has resources you know across like from the first century all the way up to 2020 and so it really cut and randy forgive me if i didn't get one of your songs in there uh i i, I kind of represented the salvation army on this committee and uh was able to bring in uh i did get all that i am a, a song Sweet. of bills or two and then uh uh, and then uh, Albert Orsborn, a couple of the cl classic songs, but, but it's, it's that same thing. Like this is a vetting process. This is a process whereby we're setting something up. And one of the interesting thing, I'm just going to make a observation as a preaching professor, before we go here, I want to have everybody close out and Phil, I'll have you go first. I'm not even going to ask you a specific question, but I just want you to say whatever else I haven't asked you or what you'd like to say. But as a preaching professor, I find it interesting that probably these four churches and their preachers probably have content that is making its way into churches as well when people need to be reading wider and thinking differently about how they preach. I think there is probably harder to assess that, but of course there's, I have a whole unit on plagiarism in my intro to preaching class because of these same issues. So those of you who are preachers and have looking down your nose at the musicians for this at this point, uh, don't do it. Okay. Phil, what closest, uh, uh, go, we'll go around, but I want to start with you and just get some last words before we have to go. Yeah, I, I mean, thank, thanks, Andy. It's, it's a fascinating. I think it, I mean, this deserves even more uh, uh, conversation yeah. and discussion. Um, I think, I, I think a, a couple of things. I think as I have, you know, I've been leading worship now for um, 20, 25 years. And have just realized that that's really helpful. Actually, just the reminder of uh, that that both Jonathan and Randy shared about the the structure of of choosing songs for worship. And I know that it's different in different denominations. For instance, I've already mentioned we have a high value. Randy and I have had a discussion about this. We have a high value where we are uh, of experience and of, of of people experiencing not. Not that that means other places don't, but but that's a high value for us, and so the lingering is is uh, what we what we spend a lot of time doing, just because we find in our context that there, you know, um, and I think it's probably common in a lot of places. There's just a lot of emotional hurt that people need to know that there's a that the Holy Spirit has real love for them. Not not that it always has to be felt, but it, in a lot of times in our context. People need to just sit and come into contact with a God and hear over and over to them that God loves them. You're loved by God. You're held by God. You're forgiven by God. God's great covers your sin. Like there's a lot of that where we are. Um, and so, yeah, but that, but again, that's context, right? That's knowing your people. That's knowing what the Lord and listening to reading the scripture, listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying for your people in that season. Um where I am, that's where that's where it is right now. So that's what I'd say. Yeah, and Phil, I, I don't know if I gave a proper commercial for it. You didn't ask for this, but you had some. You had a song that just came out recently. You want to give us a little speaking. Story. Speaking of which, uh, speaking of people needing to know that they are loved, the first track of my new EP is called "You Are Loved," and uh, it's great, uh, yeah, the great song, incredible song. It, yeah, it's not it's not exactly a worship song, but the EP is just a three song EP. It's called Goalette. Um, let the let the listener, let the Bible scholar listener uh hear and understand where that comes from. Uh Andy, where did it come from? I missed the word that you said. Co Kohelet. Oh, forgive me. I don't know. I'm not, oh, a, I'm not I'm a historian, not, historical theologian, not okay. a Bible scholar. We'll forgive you. It's the Hebrew word for the preacher in Ecclesiastes, and the themes of the oh, okay. CP are three songs from the book of Ecclesiastes. It is now available everywhere you find your music. Thank you. Thank you for that good commercial and for putting me on the spot. Now I have to go back to Hebrew. <laughs> My boss, who is a Hebrew scholar, is going to get on to me. Okay, Randy, what do you have to say? Close, uh, close this out before we go to Jonathan. So uh, famously, or not so famously, Keith Getty did a, an interview on CBS this morning, uh, many years ago. And he said this, he said, uh, the, the bad, the good news is preachers, no matter how bad your sermon is, the last thing people will remember is the <laughs> hymn, that, hymn that you sing. As, <laughs> as you leave. He said, however, the bad news is that the, yeah. the thing people are going to remember is the last hymn we sing. Right, right. So no matter how good you are, that's what they're going to remember. And so I, I, I say to all my worship pastors and people selecting music, 
you have a huge responsibility because you are teaching people the Bible and mm -hmm. teaching people about who God is and how you can experience him um, by the songs that we sing. Yeah, beautiful. That is a good reminder, Andy. Yeah. Jonathan? Yeah, one of the things that really stands out to me when um, we have, um, you know, four churches that are uh, producing and, and really influencing the majority of the music sung in churches is that the marginalized become further marginalized. Mm -hmm. Um, in uh, both songwriters, song content, whatever that is, um, minority voices are not considered um, and and continue to not have a voice. Um, and so um, some of those perspectives even, you know, um, uh, I think Maverick City is doing a better job at bringing in um, some things uh, that we've not had over the last few decades, sure. not much longer than that. But, um, you know, what what do we need to be hearing from the black church, actually, in terms of um, music, uh, music styles, but also just the content, the prayers, what prayers are they offering that they can help us in our own prayer life um, yes. Yes. Uh, through music uh, um, in particular? And uh, and 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 we don't um, hear their prayers uh, in, in that way. And um, and, and that's concerning. And um and I think that's something we need to pay attention to and to say, you know, there, there is an onus on us then to, to, to do even more work, to discover those resources that, are, that aren't even natural to us or um, easily accessible maybe, but to, um, to hear those voices, to hear those perspectives, and to know how to rightfully bring them into our congregations. It's not just a complete overhaul or, you know, avoid tokenism especially, but to, uh, um, but to say there's meaningful ways we need to hear these these prayers and these voices and to allow them a place um, in our worship as well um, to, to, to have at least a space there. Um, yeah. To begin to hear. That's great, Jonathan. And, and I'll say just those of you who are in administrative positions and you have opportunities to release money, this is an opportunity for you to encourage people, like to encourage people to write songs, um, to contact people like Phil and Randy. To, to commission them to write pieces, write songs for a work. If you're planning ahead enough and you know you have a worship series coming up, you know, to do that and to encourage young musicians, um, make sure that these things are happening. I mean, one of the things about the tradition that I came from in the Salvation Army was did encourage music. Now, sadly, I know Randy's really disappointed. There's no brass band music on this list. Uh, no, <laughs> but ne nevertheless, like, like we come from this, these these traditions that that encourage music education, music education can something that can happen through the life of the church. So I just want to encourage people to think about those things. Well, I also want to thank my three friends for coming on and helping me think through this. I encourage you to wherever you're watching or listening to this to subscribe, like, or whatever you have to do to kind of follow these podcasts more. I know that Phil might use this, maybe others will use this in, in class. Jonathan, you might use it in a class or something. So Wherever this is going, we're thankful for this time. And I thank you guys for coming along and joining us. Mm -hmm.